This is Yaira. Yes, it is. And I don't recognize you with your mask on. Yeah, I know. I'm feeling a little under the weather, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You're not feeling I'm well? Feeling, no, but I'm in a public space. So I don't want anyone else to possibly get Well, that's very really considerate of you. Hi, here you are. I'm here. I'm here. Really? Yeah. Here, right? <laughs> okay. What will we do without your smiling face? <laughs> Leia. No. Good morning. Leia Ferdman. Yeah. Shoshana to the Raja, Malka Nath, Rahul Khanna Nath, Rivka Ram Nath. Hannah Ruman, we saw her. Pedro Shagala was her birthday yesterday. Mrs. Shapiro. Good morning. Who is Shira Stahl? She's a new, new person. A new patient? I'm a new patient. Uh -huh. Rahul Khanna, good morning. Batya, where's Batya? She's coming. I think she's going to come in a few minutes. Yeah. She's here. She's here. Batya's here. She's okay. here. Batya's here. Batya's here. Oh, good. Baruch Hashem. Daughter of Hashem. Yeah. <laughs> Connecticut, what's your name? John. Gianna. Mm -hmm. Is that like a Russian name? No, it's not. I think it's Italian, actually. Italian? Gianna? Yes. What does it mean? It didn't, yeah, it was it's like Grace. Something. something like that? Yeah. Something like that. Let me look it up because I was asked this recently. Last name? Michael said. <laughs> Oh, really? Behind me or behind her? Behind her. 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 Uh, so oh. she's here. She's here. Oh, okay. So she And Yaira. Yaira, what's your last name? Katz, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, it is. How do you like that? Feel better. Tanya, could someone give me a Tanya, please? Yeah. Chapter two, about the second soul. Thank you. Chapter two is about the second soul, Nefesh Hashenis. In Chabad shuls, there was always a Chabad room, which was like the second room. The big shul was where people would daven, and they had a second room where people were quiet, and if a person wanted to daven long, meditatively, he would go into the second room. Once I heard the Rebbe say that this person should take a second soul into the second room. And we learn about it in the second, in the second chapter. Everything has a place. And we learned the first metaphor 
image of what the second soul is. It's a first line tells us it's a chaylik eloka mimal mamish. It's a portion, a part of Hashem. This is a very important thing to remember at all times. And when I say at all times, it really means at all times. I was thinking as I walked to, to Yeshiva this morning, I was thinking about this, and I was reminded of a story. I hear that some of you girls like to hear stories. Yeah. yeah. Oh, also, the, the story about the really, you told us to remind you the story about the mamash. Mamash? Yeah. Really. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you yesterday that Yaakov kept the, mam, the mamash of the angels by himself. I don't think that was the story. But yeah, I think it was something else. Okay, here we go. Here's the story. How are we supposed to understand what it means that the second soul is a chelik elokam imam mamash? That this is, this is, this, everybody has this. You have this. You have this soul. This soul is, the, is, is Hashem. Okay, so the story is, I think, from the city of Nice in the south of France. The rabbi there is Rabbi Gorevich. Just for the record, Anybody by the name Gorevich, their real name is Horowitz. Yes, but in Russia, they can't pronounce the H. They call it Gorevich. So you have the town, of, you have, for instance, Rabbi Isaac of Hummel, but the name of the town is Gommel. They don't pronounce the H, they call it, they call it a G. And there's a very famous family the, uh, at the head of the family is a great scholar by the name of Horowitz, and all the all the Goreviches are descended from him. They are Levium. They are from the family of the tribe of Levi. So he is the Shliach there, and there was a very wealthy. Jewish family with a young, handsome young man driving the, the, you know, the fanciest kind of a car. And he had the fanciest kind of a girlfriend, but she was not Jewish. Just one little problem. She wasn't Jewish. And they fell in love and they were going to get married. And even though he liked the rabbi, the family were very close with the rabbi. And he felt quite comfortable coming to Shul. You know, his uh, traditional old Jewish guy, but he wanted to marry this non-Jewish girl. And no, nothing that anybody would say to him could talk him out of it. Finally, and he heard all the different reasons why. And finally, it uh, the, the rabbi just suggested, well, look, I can't t tell you anything more. Let's go to see the rabbi. That's all. And so he was very well. He paid for two tickets, and off they went. They came to New York on Sunday dollars. They went through. They told the Rebbe, whatever they told the Rebbe. I don't know what words they told the Rebbe, and I don't know what the Rebbe replied. Perhaps he said, I don't know what the Rebbe replied. I know in a similar situation, one time the Rebbe said to the person, well, I'm very envious of you. He said, what? You envy me because I want to marry a non-Jewish girl? You want to, couldn't believe it. I said, yeah, I really envy you. Not because I want to marry a non-Jewish girl, heaven forbid, I married the Rebetzin. But I envy you the test that you're stand, that standing before you. And surely you will rise to this test and will redound to your benefit for the rest of your life. 
and he gave him a dollar for tzedakah. And a few months later, the guy came back to the shlich and said, Rabbi, I broke up with the girl. He said, how come? He said, my mother was very, she, she wanted me to see this rabbi, she wanted me to see that rabbi. I heard what they all had to say. This one said had his reasons, this one had that, his reasons. They all had reasons why it wouldn't work. But I didn't buy their reasons. The Reb is the only one who spoke to me about myself. And that made sense. Anyway, so now back to the story in these. So this guy came to the Reb again, it didn't help. Even that, even being by the, by the Reb, it didn't help. And they're going through the wedding and the wedding had two stages. The first stage was a procession, like a parade through the town. Remember, they're big, wealthy, fancy families. They paraded through the town with the Hassan Kala, every full of rejoicing. And the stage number one is to come to the courthouse or the office of the mayor, where he is going to marry them a civil marriage. Then the second stage is to go to the church. And there they will sanctify their, their matrimony. And they so they, they come into the offices of the Lord Mayor of the city, and they're standing before him, and he turns to the young man, and he says, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he doesn't answer. Silence in the court. Everybody's shocked. And he asks him a second time, maybe you didn't hear me, I asked that you take this young lady to be your lawfully wedded wife. And he doesn't answer. Now the judges, everybody is puzzled, surprised, astonished. And he asks him a third time, do you take this lovely lady, your lovely young lady to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he says, no, no, no. And her brothers jump on him and start beating him up until he can free himself from them. And he runs away and nobody knows where he went. He disappears for 10 years. And when he comes back, he's dressed like a, like a religious Jew with a, a yarmulke and tzitzis and a beard. And uh, nobody recognizes him anymore. The rabbi takes him aside and says, what happened? He says, Rabbi, I don't know what to tell you. When he asked me if I would marry the girl, I, I saw the rabbi standing in front of me. I couldn't say yes. The rabbi was right there. Okay, why do I tell you that story? Okay, how, well, how do we know the story? Because the rabbi told that story at a fundraising dinner for his Chabad house. And he said, and the young man here is here with us tonight. And this is the, this is the organization that you're supporting, which is an outpost of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he's together with every single one of us, and so on and so on. What's the point of the story? Why am I telling you this story? Because we're learning about this Nefesh Hashenis, the second soul is a Chelek Elokam Imam Mamish. Just like this person could not say, yes, I'm going to marry a non-Jewish girl. So that's how we have to understand that wherever we go and whatever we do, we are standing in front of Hashem, who is our second soul. Our nefesh elokis is a chelak elokam imam mamish. We are constantly standing before Hashem. And like I said a few times already, how do we know? How do we? How can I make this association? Am I just being poetic? No. We have a posuk. Yaakov Avinu had a famous dream. They call it in English, Jacob's Ladder. He went to sleep and he dreamed of a ladder going from where he was way up into heaven and angels going up and coming down. And it says there, Hine Hashem Nitzav Allah. Behold, Hashem is standing before you. And he, he looks into your heart and into your kidneys, which gives blood for your heart, create the blood. 
They are the advisors, the spiritual advisors of a person to see if you're serving him in a proper way. So Hina Hashem Nitzav Allah, this is one of the 12 psukim that the Rebbe taught every Jewish child to know. Hina Hashem Nitzav Allah, when you're standing before the justice of the peace and he says, do you want to marry, do something totally against Hashem? You can't do it. You can't do it because you see that Hashem is standing right in front of you. Along the same lines, very, very similar in, its, in the content of the story. Somebody just told me this story uh, last week. Similar situation, young man wants to marry a non-Jewish girl. The rabbi says to him, come with me, I want to go to the, to the shul with you. They go down to the shul and it's nighttime and it's dark. You just have the one lamp lit over the iron Kaidish. And he says to him, go open the iron. He's very puzzled, he opens the iron. He says, take out a Sefer Torah. Take out a Sefer Torah? You only take out a Sefer Torah with there's 10 people. He says, throw it down on the floor. What? I said, throw it down on the floor. Rabbi, I can't do that. So I'm your rabbi, I'm telling you, throw it down on the floor and jump on it. Rabbi, I can't do that. I can't, I'm telling you to do it. I can't, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. So he says, well, you should know. If you marry a non-Jewish girl, it's more painful and outrageous to Hashem than jumping on a safer tire. And that's struggle. It's another way of saying the same thing. That the nefesh Hashem's soul is truly a part of Hashem from above, and it's part of you. And therefore, when a person is tempted, we're all tempted. Everybody is tempted. Has all kinds of temptations, big temptations, and little temptations. A big temptation can be mamish to do a terrible thing, to do something totally forbidden, or a big a big temptation could be. If the Rebbe advises you to do something that you don't want to do, or tells you not to do something that you really do want to do, and you think, well, maybe the Rebbe just doesn't understand. If I would explain it better to him, he would understand, he would surely give me a bra. That's also a temptation. So you have to know, whatever level you're on, you have to know you're standing before Hashem. You can't play games with Hashem. You're taking your godly soul into a place, make sure it's a place where he, where your godly soul wants to go. So we had all that's introduction, just to give you girls, to give all of us really, a, a feeling, an emotion that we can relate to what it means that we have a godly soul. And we're responsible, we have to be given that privilege that we have a godly soul it's something very special that's that we get because we're jewish it come, with it comes a responsibility right? a responsibility to behave appropriately in all in all circumstances and it's not easy because there will always be temptations large and small i'll give you an example of a small temptation a small temptation but it's just as big as a big one Um, let's say it's almost Shabbos. It's almost Shkia. And it's winter time. So you're going to have to open the closet. In my house, I have a clothes closet. And the clothes closet has a button. And when you open the door, the light goes on. Similarly, people have frigidaires. When you open the frigidaire door, the light goes on. You have to tape the button on the Frigidaire so that you can use the Frigidaire and not turn the light on. You have to tape the button closed. Or the closed closet, you have to turn off the switch. So if you open the door, aye, but it's winter. Or, oh, aye, you're gonna need to take the food out of the Frigidaire. And you forgot to tape the Frigidaire. Oh, you forgot to turn off the button. And it's Mama Shkia. And it's a minute or two after Shkia. 
What are you going to do? Find a boy in the street. What are you going to do? Ah, who's going to know? Quick, flip the button. Shabbos. Shabbos. It's a temptation. If you do nothing, it's Shabbos. Guests are going to come. It's time for the meal. You turn to your wife. You turn to your I forgot to take the fridge in there. We can't take anything out of the fridge. Or in the winter time, to adjust the heat so the house will be warm. So there have been times when I had to stand out in the, on the sidewalk in the freezing cold till a non-Jewish person would come by and I could convince them, explain to them, could you please come into my house? I have a problem. It's the Sabbath. Da, da, da. They don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to your house. Don't tell me going to your house. A little test. It's a little test. It's just a little thing. But, it, but you see, in the Hashem Nitzav Allah, Hashem is standing over you. He's looking into your heart. He's looking into your kidneys. See what's really cooking with you. Okay, so... <clears throat> Now the author have explained how do we know, how do we know that this is true? How do we know we have such a soul? Because we have a pasuk. The pasuk says Hashem blew a soul into Adam, and this applies. We are all the children of Adam, but this applies to everybody. This is the godly soul that He blows into us, and we did the exercise that blowing it when you blow, like it says in the the Zohar, a person who blows blows from deep down inside. So that's a metaphor. That's a physical way that we can understand. Like it says, from my own physical being, I can understand lofty, godly concepts. Then the Alter Rebbe gives us a second metaphor, second idea how to understand what is this godly soul. So we have to understand, we're going to understand in more detail as we get into the rest of this chapter and the next chapter, that the DNA, our spiritual DNA, is ten part, ten parts. Just like the world is created with ten sayings, and the Torah is given with ten commandments. You know, five fingers and five fingers makes ten. That's Sholem. The Torah is called the Torah of peace. Hashem is the God of peace. Five and five makes ten. It's not an accident. Your soul has 10 aspects to it as well. And they subdivide into two, not five and five, but three and seven. There are, by the way, also 10 kosher animals in the world, not 11, not nine, 10. Three, seven are wild. I said last week, we just went through this, right? We named, I think, six of them yeah. by, by, by memory. And we have three, and three others are domestic animals. So if we want to bring an offering to the temple, to the holy temple, and Moshe is going to come, we're going to have the base of Migdash. We want to bring an offering to the base of Migdash. We don't have to go hunting. Yitzhak, Yitzhak told Esau to bring him a kind of delicious dish that he liked to make. And he went hunting and he, he warned them. He said, be sure you get me a kosher animal and you sh sharpen your, your knife, the, 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 the arrows that you shoot to cut the, to, to kill the animal in a kosher way. He went hunting. We don't have to go, go hunting. We want to bring a sacrifice. We have domestic animals to go to the farmer, or go to the base of Midrash. They have their own supply and we buy a, a kosher animal from them a goat, a sheep, or a cow, or a bull. Three kosher animals. Okay, that's a digression. Ten aspects to your soul subdivide into three and seven. Three stands for what's in your head. Right side of your head, left side of your head, back of your head. That's Chochmah bin Adas. And the seven stands for the seven days of the week. And these are the days of action, the days in which Hashem creates the world. These are the seven motivating drives which, which uh, 
are the energy behind all the actions that we do. The, obviously, in the, the intellectual aspects, the three are from a much higher level than the emotional aspects. Because your intellect can control your actions. Like you have a horse and a rider. Who is stronger? The horse. Who's in control? The rider. So your active drives are much stronger than your intellect. You can't do anything with your brains. You can only do things with your active energies. But your brains control your active energies. So that's higher. In the brains, you have Chabad, Chochma Bin Adas. The highest of these levels is Chochma. Chochma, we learned in last week, is the dot from which all things begin, the Yud, the first letter of the name of God, the first, the beginning of every other letter of the alphabet, of the olive base, is a Yud. And from that Yud comes out every other letter. They all start with the Yud. So that's the beginning of all the 10 aspects. But where did that beginning come from? That beginning comes from much higher than that, which doesn't, we can't uh, talk about it too much because it's higher than letters. It's a point that's higher than letters. We said yesterday, we talked about the lightning rod on top of a building. And if the lightning comes, where's it gonna strike? The bottom of the rod? The top of the rod, the tippy top. So from the tippy top, uh, where energy comes into you, where does energy come into you? Life energy comes into you from the very highest point. The very highest point of these 10 aspects is called Chachma. Chachma, we're gonna learn, is only a potential. It's not, it's, it's, there's nothing there. You can, you can describe it, the shape, just a dot. A dot is just a potential. It stands for a potential, but there's a thorn going up. The potential comes from something much higher, comes from something infinite. That's pure, pure energy, pure godly energy. Okay. So from this level of your chachma, which uh, finds its place in your brain, if this is the highest point of life that's in you. And that's where the creative drop comes from, from which a child is born. So we see from this <clears throat> that after a whole cracking process by which this life energy comes down, down, down until it can, can meet with physical form, it has a spiritual energy, it is a spiritual energy. And that's where, that's where life comes from. in a person. And that's why the creative seminal drop of creation is white. Because it comes from such a high, high, high place. And Hashem, so, so that's when anybody has a child. That's what's happening. Now, let's apply that as a metaphor to understand what's going on with Hashem that Hashem said, you know, there's a, why a father has such a connection to his firstborn child, right? Because that's the first life that's coming from him to create. Maybe there'll be other children afterwards. They'll all come from a very high place. But this is the first of all of them. So Hashem says about the Jewish people, when Moshe Rabbeinu goes to Pharaoh and says, you have to let the Jewish people go because Hashem says, they are my firstborn child. Bani, my son, Bechari, my firstborn, Yisrael, that's the Jewish people. That's what Hashem says to Pharaoh, and therefore you have to let them go. They don't belong to you. They belong to me. They are my firstborn son. Bani matem l'ashem alokechem. You are children to Hashem, your God. Page 51. To the top. Perush, what does this mean? 
כמי שהבן נמשך ממהר האב, now a little bit of health, what's going on here, a child is born from the brain of the father. The thought is father of the child. So to speak, let's apply the metaphor. When we apply a metaphor, there's a Hebrew word called kaviyocho, which means so to speak. We can't really define or say anything about Hashem because he's infinite and we are not. So therefore, anything we're going to say about Hashem is only so to speak. So in the same way, so to speak, Nishmas kol ish Yisrael, the soul, the neshama of every single Jewish person, Nimshcha is drawn down from the, from the highest level of Hashem's thought. And from the highest level of Hashem's thought, it comes into Hashem's Chachma. In other words, the whole concept of thought is even higher than when the thought energy comes into the brain. That's when it's already acquiring a shape, a, a, a substantiality, an insubstantial substantiality, if you will. Chokhmah is just a potential. This is the potential of the potential. The ability to think. Shem creates us with the ability of, there's a, such a thing, ability to think. Who's older, you or the ability to think? The ability to think is a power, a soul power. The power is higher than any of the vessels that could contain it. You have a bottle of wine and you have a becher that's empty. The becher can contain the wine, but the wine is not in the becher yet, it's still in the, in the bottle. So we have the power to think, but it's not in the brain yet. It's just a power, a, poss a potential, a possibility. Now it's going to come into the brain. It's going to come into the brain on the highest level of the intellect, which is called wisdom. Wisdom, inspiration. That's where inspiration comes from. You with me, Mr. Shapiro? Yeah. Yes. So we're talking about Hashem's thought, the highest level of Hashem's thought, which then comes down into the highest level, the tippy top of the lightning rod of Hashem's wisdom. And that's where the child is coming from. And before we get carried away with this, so the Alter River reminds us, don't think you know what, I, what, what, you're, what I'm talking about, because Hashem's wisdom is not like any wisdom that we understand. We know what our wisdom is something like inspiration, but that it's not Hashem's wisdom. Hashem's wisdom is infinite. That's Zohar. Hashem is wise, but his wisdom isn't our wisdom. It's not any wisdom that we can possibly conceive. But he and his wisdom are one thing. Not two separate things. So that's where the soul of a person comes from. And that's why we can say that the soul of the person is a part of God. Because it comes from Hashem's wisdom. And Hashem's wisdom and Hashem are not two things. Like you and your wisdom are two things. Because you were born, you had a brain, but there was nothing in your brain. You were only interested in nursing that point your daily your meals but as you grew older you were taught you learned brachas and you learned how to do things when you got to the age of three you could light a shabbos candle and say the blessing you learned blessings on food you acquired knowledge you acquired wisdom so it's something that's added to you it's not something you're born with it's an addition there's you, and then you're used to the wisdom that you acquire as you grow older. Hashem and his wisdom, and Hashem's wisdom isn't something that he acquires. It's part of him. It's one thing with him. And this is what the Rambam also writes. Shuhu Amada. Hashem is the knowledge and Hashem is the one who knows and Hashem is the thing known and it's impossible for a human being to understand what that means. 
because it's just words. We cannot say that we are what we know and always have been so. And we cannot say that we are the thing that we know. Like a mechanic knows a car engine. He learned. He didn't always know. He acquired the knowledge. So now he and the knowledge became connected. But they're really two separate things. Because he wasn't born with it. He had to, he had to acquire it. So it's an addition to him. Now I'll take it a step further. You can't say that he is the car engine. Maybe his thoughts are such that he's always thinking, a musician, a composer. Before he, before Beethoven thought up his fifth symphony, he, it wasn't in his brain. But after he thought it up, it was running in his brain the whole time. It became one thing with his brain. But if, what about a physical thing? What about a car engine? You can't say the mechanic is the car engine. You could say Beethoven is his fifth symphony. You could say a poet is his poem. A painter becomes a, but the painter isn't his painting. You don't put the painter up on the wall. I once saw some artists that they took this idea to a point that they themselves became art. They made a scene and they made themselves part of this scene and they just sat there as part of the scene. And that was their art, people came to see. Because they were saying, what they were really saying was, the person is art or one thing. That was the point that they were making. Or they did a little, a little dance together, same idea. But it's, it's just, it's an idea, it's not the reality. They are, you, you, we don't hang up, you know, the, the, along these lines, there was a, a chassid, he was a, a, a very, very humorous guy named Shmuel Munkus. He was a joker, a famous joker, but a very deep person, a chassid of the Alter Rebbe. And one time he went outside and there was a pole outside the doorway of the Alter Rebbe and he hung himself upside down from his knees on this pole. I said, what is Shmuel Munkus, what are you doing? He said, look, you have a shoemaker there. He has a sign with shoes on it. You have a, a candle maker there. He has a sign with candles on it. You have a tailor there. He has a sign with a kapata on it. So what do you do? You make chasidim. So I hung myself up. I'm, I'm the product of your teachings. Well, it's a joke. Because we cannot be one thing with what we understand. Although, you know, metaphorically we could, but not, not physically reality, but Hashem can. Not only Hashem can, Hashem is. Because Hashem is bringing into existence the thing that we understand and we know every single second out of nothing. So he is the life of this thing and he is this thing. So he is the, the thing he is the knowledge of the thing, and he is the one who knows the thing, and we human beings cannot understand how this is possible. We can only understand that it's a concept, but we can't understand. So Hashem, from this we conclude that Hashem and his wisdom are one thing, and we've just shown how the seminal drop from which a child is created comes from the highest level, higher even than wisdom of a person, and in, how much more so in Hashem, it comes from even higher than the wisdom of Hashem. And Hashem and his wisdom are one thing. So from this we see that the godly soul, the nefesh Hashanis, in a Jew is chelik elokam imal. It is part of God. Mamash. Have a good day. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Rabbi, you're here. Rabbi, I have a question. Thank you. Hashem should give you strength to come on time. Yes, I mean. I mean, I mean. That's a wonderful birthday. Okay. Rabbi. Been glad to have you. Yaira, have a wonderful day. I have, I have a question. Okay, good. I have a question. Um, so all of this that we're talking about. No. 
What happened? You got muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. You hear a cat. Can you hear me? Okay, but you're, you got yourself muted. I can't hear you. You must have a mute button there on the lower left side of your screen. I don't know. I don't know what happened. You said I have a question and then you, you got muted. Okay, you'll ask me tomorrow. Write it down. Write your question down and you'll ask me tomorrow. That's the session. By the way, Rabbi. Yes. On Friday, when we were walking on shore, we were looking at the sky. It was gorgeous. Yes. It was pink. It was like a Shabbos mode. It was beautiful. Yeah. What's for you? Giamma, uh, that's an exercise that everybody has to do on the way to class in the morning, which is to look up and to see what's going on in the heavens today. Today, if you looked up, you would have seen wispy, wispy clouds. I think they're called cirrus. So it's clouds. You can check up on Google, Google for the different names of clouds and what they're like. Right. right. <laughs> Just like somebody took a, a paintbrush and watercolor and made a little wash yeah. across the sky. Yeah. Wash. I, see the video? I was with them on Friday when I saw the stars. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a nice day. I looked up in the sky oh, and I'm nice. <laughs> 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 I looked up in the sky, Rabbi.
Eastern Broadway. Because I have my sports sports, sports clothes. <laughs> I'm going to school like this. Not running. I can't talk to my kids. Oh, you're not here anymore. No. Sunday, okay. Tomorrow's going to be the last day. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. We'll do our best. We'll do our best. Yeah. You voted? I just have the sticker. Okay, go sticker. Can I get the sticker? Yeah, I'll bring I'll, I'll bring I'll bring you extra. So I then I go, I'll ask for five. So you know. I'll ask for I, I have I have an extra sticker. Okay. Your guys are both, but I have moved in and you guys through this last year. Can you hold out after you're 21? After 18. Yeah. What? Why do you have Two age limits. You have 18 and 21. No, 21 is for drinking. Oh. Don't worry about it. So, are you an adult after 18 or yeah. too young? Ne neither. Neither. Yeah. Shia, good morning. Hi, everybody. I moved to my head. I don't know what's happening.